Thank you, Tammy. It's good to be with you all today to have this conversation around CTE. Um, given that we're limited on time, we're going to forego additional background and jump right into the presentation with Dr. Ellen Altamir. Thank you. Great. Thanks all for your time. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Is that visible to the group? Okay, great. Um, so um, what I'd like to do today is just to share with you some key findings from a study we recently conducted uh, that's focused on understanding uh, some of the demographic, cognitive, and attitudinal predictors of CTE course-taking plans and behaviors among students in Utah. Um, and this work was really guided by four central research questions. We started where others have uh, in the past by asking how much interest do students in our sample have in these CTE courses and does interest vary by students demographic characteristics or by their post-secondary plans. Um, secondly, we wanted to know how much do students um, perceive CTE courses as having value, um, that is, as being valuable for their future career plans or as inherently enjoyable. And we also wanted to know whether that varied by students' demographic characteristics or by their post-secondary plans. And the reason for looking at those two in tandem is that we know from prior theory and prior research that the two tend to be related. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with Jackie Eccles' expectancy value theory, which essentially says what I think we all intuitively know, which is that we tend to be interested in things that we find value in, and we tend not to be interested in the things that we see as not so valuable. We then move on to looking at decision-making styles, as Tammy noted, um, trying to figure out to what degree do decision-making styles uh, predict either student interest in or valuing of CTE courses. And the, re the reason for looking at decision-making styles is multi-fold, multi uh, if you will, but I think one reason for looking at them is because there's some things that we can change relatively quickly, right? With the appropriate messaging, we might be able to change parents or or students' perceptions of CTE courses. Decision-making styles, on the other hand, tend to be pretty trait-like. Uh, they tend to be pretty stable over time, and yet they probably impact students' decision-making. And so figuring out how do you change your messaging to meet students where they are in terms of their current decision-making styles seems imperative. Um, and then finally, we sort of bring it all together by empirically testing uh, the proposition from expectancy value theory, which, said, which says that uh, student interest should be related to students valuing the CTE courses. And this is actually, I think, some of the more interesting findings from this particular study. I think it gives us some, the findings here give us some, um, some really uh, interesting ideas, I think, about how messaging uh, might be modified a, a bit uh, to uh, reach uh, potentially more students and parents. So uh, just quickly, uh, I wanted to give you a sense of our methods. Uh, we worked really closely with Sandy and her team uh, to recruit students to participate in the survey. The survey was administered in spring of 2022, so just a few months ago. And we invited students in eight high schools uh, to participate in the survey. All of the students were in a single school district. Um, and we sent out those invitations to roughly 20,000 students. Um, roughly 6,000 of those students completed the survey, which represents a 29.8% response rate. Uh, one of the questions that we had initially um, is, to what degree is the sample um, a representative of the larger student population? Can we actually generalize these results to the larger student body? And all indications are that we can. Um, just to give you a quick example of this, we looked at the distribution of our sample by race and ethnicity and compared that to the student population distribution by race and ethnicity, and you can see they very closely align. Um, and I also wanted to point out that we got some diversity in terms of students' post-secondary plans. So we asked students what they plan on doing after high school. 70% indicated that they plan to go, on college, go to college either immediately or after a gap year. 20% indicated that they planned on pursuing some sort of training other than college, so maybe in the military or in an apprenticeship program. Um, and then 28% uh, indicated they plan to pursue full-time work uh, immediately after high school. Um, you might notice that those percentages don't add up to 100%, and that's not an error. It's because students uh, had an opportunity to select more than one uh, path. So a student might indicate that they wanted to go to college um, while simultaneously uh, pursuing full-time work. Okay, uh, so research question one was how much interest do students in our sample have in CTE courses? And one of the things to keep in mind throughout the talk today is how we operationalized interest. 
Um, in this particular study, we started with the fact uh, that students in Utah are required to take one, but only one CTE course in order to graduate. And so we surmised that a student might have high or higher interest in CTE courses uh, if they took more than that one required course or plan to do so uh, over the course of their high school careers. And so using that operational definition, we found that 44% of the students reported high uh, interest in CTE courses in our sample. We didn't spend a lot of time in this particular study looking at interest by specific CTE area, but we did we did uh, uh, look at those uh, data a bit. Um, and what you can see on this slide is that interest did vary by CTE area, where uh, roughly one in four to one in three students uh, expressed uh, either interest or high levels of interest in uh, in four areas: arts, audiovisual technology, and communications, business management. Uh, engineering and technology or health sciences. And that uh, aligns pretty nicely with what we're seeing nationally as well with some um, diversity depending on the particular sample. Um, but for the most part, we looked at general interest. Um, and when we did so, we found some um, interesting um, disparities um, in interest to buy demographic characteristics and post-secondary plans. Uh, wherein uh, we found that interest was lower among male students, students who do not identify as Asian or white, younger students and students who are not college bound. And I can't see any faces, but my guess is that some of you are thinking that doesn't sound right. Um, and I think it's it's likely because um, it really depends on how you're operationalizing interest. If you're looking at students who are CTE concentrators, right, or completers in a particular uh, CTE pathway, there you're probably going to find higher interest. And in fact, the national data suggests is that uh, among male students, for example. Um, so keep in mind how we're defining uh, interest um, as we uh, go through these findings. Um, I'm going to quickly show you these data, um, but in the interest of time, not uh, belabor the points. Uh, so we found some uh, differences in interest uh, in CTE courses by gender, such that males uh, reported uh, lower interest uh, than females. The gap wasn't huge, uh, but it was um, statistically significant and not uh, super minor. Uh, we found that student interest in CTE courses varied by race and ethnicity, um, where uh, students who did not identify as Asian or white uh, tended to uh, express uh, reduced interest in CTE courses compared to uh, their peers. We found interest in CTE courses varied by grade level, such that younger students reported lower interest than older students, which I think makes some sense. Um, as you move through high school, right, you might learn about a CTE course through a teacher or a peer that you didn't know about before. Um, you learn about new career pathways. Um, you might discover a gap in your schedule where a CTE course would nicely fit. Um, so that makes some sense. And then finally, uh, we found that student interest in CTE courses, as we operationalized it, uh, varied by post-secondary plans, where students who plan to attend college um, actually reported higher levels of interest than students who did not. Um, so if you just compare the green and, and uh, gray bar in that first column, um, you can see that finding. Okay, uh, in terms of valuing, uh, we uh, were interested in how much students in our sample valued CTE courses, and again, whether that varied by demographic characteristics or post-secondary plans. Uh, consistent with the existing literature, we looked at two types of value. Intrinsic value is the degree to which uh, a person finds personal enjoyment uh, from engaging in a particular activity. Uh, and we assessed intrinsic value with three items uh, that formed a reliable scale. Um, and we asked students to rate uh, themselves uh, as, uh, as strongly disagreeing or strongly agreeing, uh, again, on a five point scale um, in terms of items like CTE classes are enjoyable. So higher scores uh, indicate greater intrinsic value. Um, and then we assessed utility value, which refers to the perceived usefulness of an activity for achieving one's future goals. Um, again, students uh, rated their level of agreement with here 10 items, um, which actually formed two reliable scales um, that sort of factor analyzed into two uh, clear subscales. One was utility value for college and career readiness. So students who had high scores on this particular subscale tended to agree with items like CTE classes can benefit students by providing real world knowledge and skills. And then we found a separate scub sale that was really about utility value for jobs and networking. So students who had high scores on this subscale tended to agree with items like CTE classes provide networking opportunities or industry connections. 
Um, overall, you can kind of see that students' responses across the board were above the midpoint of the scale. So students tend to do agree, uh, to Tammy's point earlier, that these courses have value. They were more likely to agree with that than disagree. On the other hand, uh, there's room for improvement, right? If the goal is to improve uh, students' perceptions of the value uh, of CTE courses, there's room uh, to do so. The findings in terms of demographic um, and uh, post-secondary predictors of perceptions of value were identical to what we saw for interest. Uh, perceptions of value were lower among male students, students who did not identify as Asian or white, younger students, and students who are not college bound, which is exactly what you would predict from expectancy value theory, which suggests that interest and value are really closely aligned. In the interest of time, I'm not going to show you all of these data, um, but I'm happy to provide uh, the slides. Um, but Again, the patterns are exactly the same as what we saw for interest. Instead, I'm gonna move ahead uh, to question three, uh, which asks, do decision-making styles predict student interest in or valuing a CTE courses? And for this, we really borrowed from uh, Scott and Brown's model of decision-making styles. And they identify five uh, types of, of styles that people tend to use as they approach major decisions. A rational style is one which emphasizes a thorough search for and logical evaluation of alternatives. An intuitive style is one which emphasizes a reliance on hunches and feelings. A dependent style is uh, one where you emphasize a search for advice and direction from others. An avoidant style emphasizes postponing and avoiding decisions. Um, and a spontaneous style emphasizes a sense of immediacy in making decisions. So this sort of idea that you need to make a decision quickly uh, without maybe all of the information. Um, as you read over those, you can probably find yourself uh, somewhere in there. Um, but you probably also uh, recognize that the decision making style that you use probably depends on context. You might use uh, one style in one context and another style in another context. The other thing to keep in mind is this is not like the Myers-Briggs uh, topology where you're an INTJ or something. Um, it is uh, possible for you to score high on more than one of these styles. So you could be someone who adopts a rational style, um, but in a dependent sort of way, right? So, so you try to look for, you know, thorough search uh, and logical evaluation of alternatives by talking to lots of different people and seeking their advice. Uh, so it's possible to be high on, uh, on more than one. Um, you can see there to the right uh, that uh, when we ask students to agree, um, to express their level of agreement on a five point scale ranging from strongly disagree to strongly agree with items that tap each of these styles. It's a 25 item scale, five items per, per um, style. You can see that students are most likely to endorse a rational style and least likely to endorse a spontaneous style. Uh, we're a culture that I think sort of celebrates spontaneity, but not so much among uh, high school students perhaps. Uh, and so that's probably reflecting uh, what's happening here. Okay, um, so our central question here was, um, do these decision making styles predict students interest in valuing of CTE courses? Um, and there's sort of a lot to look at at this slide, but to break it down, we've got styles in the first column. Along the top row, we have our um, four outcome variables, interest and in the three types of valuing. Um, all of the green boxes represent a positive association between a style and a particular outcome. Um, all of the red boxes indicate a negative association, so scores on one variable go up, scores on the other variable go down. Um, the stars indicate a statistically significant effect. Um, and then the um, absolute value of the beta coefficients, which are represented here, tell you just how strong is that relationship. And you can kind of see that students who have a rational style, if you look at that first row, are the most likely to uh, express interest in CTE courses, um, to see those courses as having value both sort of in the moment um, in terms of their future career plans. Whereas students with an avoidance style, which makes sense, I don't want to think about it, are saying, I, I don't really see, I don't have much interest in these courses, and I don't necessarily see the value of these courses. We'll talk more about that in just a second, but I do want to sort of um, point your attention to the, the random green box there with spontaneous styles. What that's essentially saying is that students who are saying, look, I make snap decisions, are more likely to see the utility value of CTE courses for jobs and networking, which makes a little bit of sense, right? Sometimes you just have to grab that job. Sometimes you just have to look for that network, uh, networking opportunity 
And you might not be really well qualified uh, at the moment, uh, but you just sort of grab it, right? These are sort of our future entrepreneurs. So one of the things that I think is important to keep in mind here is that we tend to sort of value certain styles over others, um, but our entrepreneurs probably benefit from this sort of spontaneous style. So we probably don't want to squelch any particular style. They all have value um, in particular contexts. And then finally, uh, we were interested in um, the degree to which students' perceptions of the value of CTE courses um, relate to or predict uh, their interest in CTE courses. And again, this is a, a test of expectancy value model, uh, expectancy value theory in the context of CTE courses. And let me sort of break this down for you as well. Along the x-axis, we have students' ratings of value. Um, those can range from one to five, one indicating very little perception of value, five high perceptions of value. We have that for each of the three types of value. And then along the y-axis, we have student interest. And this is at the group level. Um, so zero would indicate no one has any interest in taking more than that one required CTE class. A one would indicate all of the students uh, have interest in taking that CTE class. The red lines represent uh, regression lines from logistic regressions. And then the Gray dots um, indicate particular particular values um, that sort of um, inform those regression lines. So if you look at the arrow in that first panel, um, those are students who, as a group, uh, tend to rate um, themselves as having really high perceptions of the intrinsic value of CTE courses. Uh, there's three items. They rate them at 4.67 out of five. 77% of those 274 students in our sample um, indicated that they'd already taken or plan to take more than the one required CTE credit. Compare that to students who rated their perceptions of the intrinsic value of CTE courses at a one or less than a two, there we're looking at 20, 25% uh, of students uh, expressing interest. That's a huge gap, right? 25% versus 75%. And so you want to pay attention to sort of the red lines overall. And what that indicates is that the two tend to be related as we would expect, right? Students who value these courses tend to show more interest in those courses, but the slopes of the line differ. And so essentially what this shows is that if you want the most bang for your buck, if you will, um, you really want to think about messaging that um, focuses on the intrinsic value of CTE courses. That's the fastest way to move students from low levels of interest to higher levels of interest, which makes complete sense, right? We as human beings tend to be sort of focused on what's good for me in the moment, uh, sort of proximal goals. Asking an adolescent to think about college and career and jobs and networking, that can be moderately effective, right? We see that in the positive slopes of the lines. But that feels a lot less um, sort of... Um, you know, proximal uh, than, am I going to have fun in my sixth period class? Um, and my own perception in looking at the literature is that we tend to focus on college and careers and jobs and networking as the major message, which might appeal to the students' parents, um, but may appeal less to the students themselves. So keeping in mind that messaging is probably important. Okay, uh, to end, uh, in terms of implications, um, we probably, um, could do more uh, to attend to groups of students who have lower levels of interest in CTE courses or who perceive those courses as valuable um, or as less valuable rather. Um, in the current study, this was, um, oh, there's some changes here. Uh, in any case, we're talking about students who were, um, did not identify as Asian white, younger students, students who are not college bound male students. Um, and so, um, you know, focusing some attention on those students probably makes some sense. Um, we should probably pay more attention to students' decision-making styles. They're going to bring those to um, these sorts of contexts um, and sort of recognizing those differences, realizing that students with an avoidance style, right, might benefit from additional meetings with teachers or school counselors or conversations with parents involved uh, to get them to really consider the value of these courses. And then finally, uh, recruitment efforts might employ a broader range of messaging strategies, including the value of these courses um, in the moment. Uh, they're, they're engaging, uh, they're challenging, they're enjoyable. All right, I think I managed to do that in about 25 minutes. Uh, any questions or, um, I'm happy to take questions, um, you know, sort of online as well.
As Tammy's coming up to the front, I think it's worth noting. I think I see um, one of our excellent district partners, Sandy Hemrit, um, there. Um, I don't know if it's on the right or left side. I can't tell. That's Sandy. Yes. Um, one of the benefits we have working with an intermediary like STEMAC is the opportunity to extend our partnerships with local schools and districts. And if you don't know, if you're not personally engaged with Sandy, um, she's someone to connect with at the break because she's one of our greatest partners who always forefronts data and making data informed decisions. So, I was just wondering, what are your next steps after this? Yeah, I think there's a, a number of possible next steps. One of the things that sort of strikes me is that we could actually empirically test, right, uh, a variety of messaging strategies on a variety of different types of students, right? These uh, data, I think, are um, suggestive uh, of a possible connection, uh, but that's an, th those are empirical, empirically testable hypotheses. The other is a, because we partnered with Sandy and STEMAC in the district, um, we're also able to begin looking at whether or not what students express as their intention is actually in reality what they do. So they're saying they have high levels of CTE. Now we can test empirically whether or not that led to them taking additional courses, how they're doing in those courses, whether or not they become concentrators in particular areas, whether it's the four that um, Ellen mentioned early on in the presentation, or do we find that those who actually express more interest are the ones who are in one of those other areas? And we did this survey in the school system with student numbers. So at the point my data people will work, that we, we need them to play nicely together. But at the point that happens, I can designate a kid who said this to these courses. So it is all set up to do exactly what I'm going to say. Well, you said all the students in Utah are required to take one CTP course. I was wondering if there's a distribution, is there is one course more popular than others? I mean, what is that one course? Um, most of those courses will be taken in from ninth grade. Um, it used to be in our junior high schools and our high schools. And those courses consistently are courses that also fill other requirements. So uh, this is not just specialist that also fills the digital studies or that. So the biggest problem with that one credit is it can start really early, but never help them move on. And so we have to do it. That's why this is so important to us is to figure out how to message to the different populations of students. Um, they take like a business? No. Oh, sure. They can take, and, and our students have enough openings in their schedules that they can do that. Um, so, yeah, they can take different kinds of things. And you heard me say, we like engineering counts as a science credit, biotechnology counts as a science credit. So really, um, what we're trying to do is work with partners in the state to uh, accounting, by the way, counts as a math credit. And so we're really trying to allow students to have options and utilize CTE to count as credits. If the best way to reach students is utilizing their intrinsic value for whatever course, what's the best way then, or an example of that a teacher could use to market a course to a student utilizing intrinsic value. I'm really curious about this because intrinsic value comes from the student. So how, how can we put them in the language? So interesting, um, we're using some tools that we've never used before to try to figure out value. Um, we've all used interest surveys and really interest surveys are kind of not really useful because it depends on the movie they watched the night before they do an interest survey. Um, but we're using a new talent assessment, um, which lets us look at what kids are really good at, even things they don't know what they're good at. Probably my favorite tool I've seen for your years. Um, and it's something that then we can align work based to field trips. Um, you show really like you have a huge talent in this area. Let's see if you want to go check on it so that they can start having this internal thing saying, oh, I love this, and I like the fact that I could help this person. Um, I, I, 
healthcare. I told you we could film healthcare. As soon as they walk in and cut the first cow heart and the blood squirts, I can tell you how many kids will leave because either they throw up or they pass out. <laughs> um, but then I can walk them and say, you like healthcare, why? And we can walk over to biotech and we can walk. So we are trying to use this. And by the way, I'm really excited for us to figure out, Andrea and all, I, I love David because it guides me in what to do, um, to figure out how to target those intrinsic values. Um, but the other piece is, this was the second survey. The first survey we believed as a group that people weren't taking CTE because they thought CTE was for those kids, the kids who couldn't do. And we were so wrong. And so what it said was you're not providing enough information. And so we started providing more information. The problem was we got a huge group of kids, but if you go to my Pacific Islanders and, and the black kids and the um, Hispanics really popped up by what we were doing. And so the question of this is then, what are we doing wrong? What, what do we have to do? I really love the idea of utilizing talent surveys. I think that's awesome. And I, I am curious, it's a little follow up. Do you have data that shows talent coinciding um, with intrinsic value for students? We haven't gotten them yet. Okay. Yeah, but we just started, we are working with a company who's really good about working with us on reports and things. And their talent assessment was more by the same group who did the ASVAB for the aptitude assessment. They're really good work. Thank you. I know we have to move on, but I have, it really is bothersome to find out, and I, I knew this to be true to some degree, uh, counselors being negative on CTE and I know within our system, counselors place students in the classes. So the magnitude or the effect of counselors being negative can actually be fairly huge if they're, since they're the ones who may be placing students in class. We are getting better because the old people are leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I wonder if that's related to um, how I know some schools get money when they have a certain amount of students that are going which are going straight into college or your university. So how much is that? Is their job related to those initiatives? See, they don't even know what CTE is. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> please, please know for counselors, and they're my peers. For counselors, they they do what they know. I often say it's kind of this incestuous thing that they went to school, they liked school, they went to school, they became a counselor, and now they work in school. So if you say to them, you need to be counseling about biotech, they don't even know what you are talking. So we're doing a lot of training and tours. Let us show you. And, and it's really funny when you have a counselor come up and say, we did this apprenticeship thing. And, Five counselors came up and said, I have this son. Do you think they could do an apprenticeship? They didn't say, I have these kids in my school. <laughs> I have, and then I said, well, tell me what you're going to do with the kids in your school, and I'll help your son get in. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Um, I think uh, Ellen and Andrea, thank you so much for taking time to share. And if anybody wants um, a copy of the full report, we're happy to share. Yes. <laughs>